Join Gator great Shane Matthews every weekday as he brings you all you need to know about your Florida Gators, including news, analysis, and opinions with some of the biggest names in sports. Find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Or watch us live at 8 a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Good morning. It's a live edition of Pot with Matthews in the Morning from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios, large enough to serve you, small enough to care. Got a lot to talk about today. Hope everybody had a great Easter weekend. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. We'll recap it with JC and Mike Morgan from the SEC Network. Let's go ahead and head to the Hey Number Hotline, courtesy of Comfort Temp. Good morning, JC. Um, yeah. Y'all are, yeah. I guess Alabama's a basketball school now, my friend. Well, it's um, I, I can't. I'd be lying if I didn't tell you I was surprised by this. Um, I, I didn't expect them to be playing defense this way. That's helped them stay in these games. And when you hit 10 threes in the second half alone in a game, it is so hard for the other team to try to match that just by simple math, simple numbers. That's 30 points right there in the second half alone from beyond the arc. And that'll be what is required if they want to stay in this next game. If they if they have a, an ounce of a chance in this next game, they're going to have to do the, very much the same type of thing and hit three shots, three point shots. But having said all that, Getting to the Final Four is a huge accomplishment. allows you to cut down the nets, and there's only four teams that are left doing it. I was impressed with NC State's second half yesterday, QB. I thought they took it to Duke and, uh, you know, basically kept that big man from fouling out, which was important for them. Having DJ uh, Burns in the game means everything for that team, and once they got on a roll, uh, they were pretty much unstoppable. UConn is unstoppable, if you ask me. And it's like I said, we're all just playing in their little world. And uh, then you've got uh, Purdue, who I think is the only team that truly could match up with Connecticut due to the fact that they've got a guy who's 7'4", and that's about the only thing that could probably stop Klingon. Donovan Klingon is the most dominant player in this tournament, if you ask me, just simply because of his presence and the way he he makes everybody defenseless. Uh, once he gets the ball in the post. So I think uh, it's a good Final Four, but I, I truly think you have two teams that are there with with hopes, and you have two teams that are there that have real actual realistic chances to win. Um, to me, Alabama would have to really shoot the lights out and, um, and get some breaks if they want to stay in it with UConn. But I'm proud of them for getting there. Nate Oates has got the program on the right track, and yes, they're a, we're a basketball school now. <laughs> You know, you know what's interesting? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think Alabama or NC State have a chance in these games, but that's why you play them. Yeah. Uh, the two best teams are, as you said, Purdue and UConn. UConn's clearly ahead of both of them. Oh. You know what's interesting is um, a lot of people may know this, they may not, but Nate Oates was a high school coach 11 years ago. Wow. Dan Hurley was a high school coach 14 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Dan Hurley – when he was building his program at Rhode Island, that's where he was before he went to UConn, his first major recruit was a kid named E.C. Matthews from Michigan, which I remember that kid, a good player. You know who his high school coach was at that time? Uh, Nate, Nate Oates. Oates. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, that is a cool connection. So yeah. yeah. Congratulations to those guys. Uh, there's a local kid. Uh, Ernest Ross, who I don't think he plays much for NC State, uh, will be going to the Final Four as well. Now, the NC State story is, is crazy. First yeah. of all, I don't know how – I watched the Duke-Houston game. Uh, Houston, you know, I, I've said this multiple times. I think Kelvin Sampson's a tremendous coach. They have great athletes. They never have great shooters, though. If he would ever get somebody that can shoot the basketball, that's what their Achilles heel is when they get in these games that are, you know – Knock down drag out. They have trouble scoring the ball. Plus, they lost their point guard. So, well, that, uh, that that was a great win for Duke. Well, it was a great win for Duke. It was a great win for Duke. Can't take anything away from Duke. They played well, but without Shed, Houston is not the same team. And if Shed's not playing, uh, you know, Houston's vulnerable. And I think with Shed, Houston would have won that game. But it, you know, it's it's um it's part of it. You know, right? I mean, you 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 need breaks. I, I mean, Connecticut's going to go to Arizona. All I can say is, and I hope you know, I'm not struck down by lightning for saying this. I just, I mean, the, 
Maybe the Arizona Mexican flu will catch their team in the hotel. I, I don't know what to do to stop that team. Connecticut doesn't care who they're playing. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter where they play. They are so tenacious and they are just so aggressive. And they've got the best guard tandem, I think, actually in the country. I think UConn's two guards are the best in the country. And so with that being said, you throw in a, an eight-footer down low, it's impossible. I don't know how you beat this team. You're going to have to hope they just really have a bad night, and you're going to have to shoot 60% from the three-point line. That's the only way you even stay in the game. So, you know, if there's anyone who can do that, we've seen Alabama do it. But I, I'm just not as – I have no no expectation whatsoever. I'm just proud of them for getting there. They're going to have a, a regional championship, if you can call it that, whatever it is. But they did beat North Carolina. That was a good win. But – UConn, to me, has the two best guards in the country. And, and I really believe they are the best tandem. And I think that team is just – it's its a fantastic job they've done up there. And Hurley is uh, – he's uh, hes the hottest where name you, in coaching right now. Where, where, where do you rank UConn among the basketball dynasties? I mean, they've well, been to the they championship win. game six they – they've been six times. They've won it five of the six. Right. But, I mean – it's crazy well, what they're doing, and, and I'm you, telling you, they're, they're not going anywhere either. Well, QB, you know, we all know here in Gainesville, Florida, what it's like to have back-to-back -back champions, right? So when, when you see what UConn's about to do, and I think they will win it, um, to me, that just – that fortifies you as a, a, not just elite, but a, somewhat of a dynasty. UConn's won a lot of – they're this blue blood as Kentucky, North Carolina, Duke, and really the only school other than them is UCLA that's got more championships, right? But UConn is – a dynasty if they win it again. And I rank them as high as, as it gets because, to me, you've got everything you need to win a championship there. You've got great won, guards, and you've got – Correct me if I'm wrong here because I don't have a computer in front of me. I believe they won more national titles than Duke has. They, yeah, I believe you're right about that. And I think they're up there with Kentucky. I think they're up there with um, – I think North Carolina's got five maybe. I don't know. But the only school that I think will have more than UConn is UCLA. So I, I I love I love yeah. uh, UConn right now, and they are killing uh, be betters. In, uh, I mean, Vegas is killing, or they they are killing Vegas. I don't know. It just seems like they cover, and not only do they cover, but they they just uh, do their business. The games, ain't, nine and the close. games ain't even close. So, no, ain't. Yeah, uh, should should be a lot of fun. Uh, that all cranks up next Saturday night. Uh, other basketball news before we move on. Riley Kugel has now verbally committed to Kansas. I think that's where he initially was wow. in Florida and Kansas, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, wow. congratulations to him. Hope it works out. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about him leaving our program if anybody's worried about that. Uh, Tony says on Facebook Live, brought to you by Mel Law, UConn may have another if Danielle Marshall doesn't miss free throws against us in 1994. Yeah, right. Rainer beat them on a the last second shot in 1990, a year before the shot versus Kentucky. Yeah. So yeah. Dan Hurley's a hell of a coach. He's he got is. great players and they're going to continue getting good players. Uh, yes. Other news over the weekend, uh, Gator Softball wins the series at Mississippi State, uh, takes two out of three against the Dogs, and at home, yep. this baseball team wins another series, takes two out of three over CAG's uh, walk-off two-run homer yesterday against the Dogs. Um, <clears throat> six and three. Know, what do y'all think of me? Yeah, they're six and three in the league. Fred wants to know what do we think of McNeely as a closer. <laughs> I mean, he did a good job for the most part, from what I could tell. Uh, yep. I watched the game off and on with some some Mississippi State folks, and uh, yeah, they love their Mississippi State baseball. There is no question about that. Uh, here's well, another text yeah. on the Titanomar text line from Chris and Mayaka. Uh, he says, "Ask all those baseball naysayers if we are still in jeopardy of missing Omaha." Uh, he asked, what? "Did I get to see the scrimmage?" No, I'm out of town. I'm not. I, I don't uh, know anything about the scrimmage. You listeners may know more about the scrimmage than I do. I think um, you know when you win these games and come from behind fashion. I, I want to say the Gators won. Just, I think they won all three games via uh, the comeback. Right? It, it's like well, we won two. We won two games. We won two games in the city state. We won them both in the bottom. Bottom that's of the ninth in both games. Right. Won. That's what that's what I meant to say. Okay, two out of three. And and you know, when Caglion hits a, a walk-off, 
you know, you, you can, you can carry that type of momentum and belief a long way as you go through a very difficult schedule in this league. And that means so much in baseball when you know that it doesn't matter if it's the seventh or eighth inning or even ninth inning, you've got, every opportunity to continue to win a game, even if you're losing, it just breeds a lot of confidence and winning these series is really the goal, right? I mean, Mississippi state is 19 and 10. They're four and five in the league. They could easily be six and three in the league as well, but they're not. And Florida is. And I just, I think that six and three record in the league and winning two out of three in these, in these weekend series is uh, something that you, you, it just baseball is so mental to me. It's such a mental game. When you believe, uh, when you've got pitching and you've got timely hitting, you you can take that very far, and you can go a long way. And then eventually, you won't be coming back. You'll be winning games, and you won't need to come back. So, um, I, you know, I'm very very happy with what uh, he's been able to do thus far. This is a tough league, and you're six and three, and everything's good. Uh, Andy says on Facebook Live, it's UCLA number one then Kentucky, North Carolina, Duke, Indiana, then UConn. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if Andy, that's his top, like, blue bloods, but I swear UConn's got more national titles than Duke and Indiana. Yeah, I, 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 I could be wrong. They, yeah, I mean, you don't know, QB. I mean, who knows what, what happened in the 50s and 60s? I, I can't really speak True. to that. But in the modern era, in the modern era, you know, Jim Calhoun, I think he won three with UConn. Um, and then this guy, won one. So here it is. Jeff just says UCLA one has eleven, Kentucky eight, North Carolina six, Duke at five. Okay. I still well, think you, UConn has five, but I'm not, I'm I i do not know why well, I they, that. They yes, I think they won three with two or three with Calhoun, another guy, and then one with Hurley, and they're about to win another. So uh, as yeah. far as I'm concerned, they are in that stratosphere, that mountain of dynasties. And as far as I'm concerned, in the modern era, they are light years ahead of Indiana. They are light years ahead of Kentucky. Okay, I don't want to hear about Kentucky anymore. They are light years ahead of um, of uh, Kansas. Well, North Carolina, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, to me, they are the they are the standard. They're the gold standard in basketball right now. They are. Now, if they win it this year, you can you can absolutely solidify that statement. Now, if they lose. And somebody, you know, upsets them, then great. We've got a true March Madness scenario where, you know, NC State beat five Slamma Jamma. You had Villanova beat Georgia. But they were, but, but, but they were only a, they were a six seed. And speaking of that, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, JC. So we're going to get to this day in sports brought to you by Campus USA Credit Union. Put some star power to work in your financial life with Campus USA Credit Union. 1985, Villanova beats Georgetown. Yeah. 66-64, the national title. The right. Wildcats are, are the lowest seeded team to ever win the national title. They were an eight right. seed. The year Valvama and them won it, they were a six seed. Right. And, and that uh, Villanova team, by the way, they have three national titles. Okay. Jay Wright won two. And Raleigh Massimino was the coach of that team in the 80s that won it, beating Georgetown. You had Houston losing to NC State. I think not, Nevada, Las Vegas lost to somebody they shouldn't have in the finals. It could happen. Dude. I'm not saying it's not ha- – I mean, absolutely watch the games, you know, but I'm just saying with the way this, this team plays and the, the teams that they're beating and the way they're beating these teams, it's almost unfair, it feels like. And, you know, the NCAA tournament committee did them a great service by just putting them on a bus and sending them to Boston. It's not a big deal. But now they got to fly to Phoenix. All right, that's a trip. Yeah, Alabama's been out there for 10 days. Uh, and I'm not sure if they're coming back or not. I don't know how that works. They already, yeah, they, they're in, they're in Tuscaloosa. They, they came back, came all back right. So they the they came back home, but they'll be heading back out on Thursday or whatever. So uh, yeah, listen, the Final Four is is a memorable thing, and it's really anybody's game. But in this case, I think you kind of so far and above everybody that they're going to win it. Now, I will say this: Purdue can match them down low with Edie, but I just don't think anybody can handle Connecticut's guards. UConn's guards are the best in the country. I, I will tell you that. I believe that. And to me, that's what's going to win it for them. Uh, text on the Titan of our text line from Jackson. He says, QB, what did, did anyone stand out at the scrimmage? Uh, I was not at the scrimmage. <laughs> the scrimmage. Um, this scrimmage is a big deal, QB. This scrimmage. Yeah, I was not there. Uh, I mean, when I'm you sure played chat board. QB, when you played sure football. The chat boards have some good information. Yeah, when you played football, QB, and you guys had scrimmages, how long did you think about those scrimmages when they were over? 
Oh, we used to. Are you talking about during the spring? Yeah, just whenever. We would we would literally sprint across the O'Donnell parking lot as soon as practice is over, get in our cars and go play golf at West End until <laughs> they turn the lights out at midnight. Exactly. exactly. That's what we did. <laughs> but hey, hey, we need a five point report on these scrimmages. Everybody's cussing at me out right now about the scrimmage. My God, get over. It. Look, that doesn't mean anything. That scrimmage, I wouldn't care if one guy, you know, had 300 yards of the scrimmage. I couldn't care less. I, that's just silly. Who cares? Yeah, for sure. Um, we got a couple of texts here or Facebook lives on about golf. Brandon says, QB, you were you and DeMarco were in school around the same time. Yeah, when I was a freshman, he was a senior. He was a good interview on the subpar podcast with Colton Knox and Drew Stoltz. He's catching a little flack for it, but I think it was overblown. Uh, you you we talked about that the other day, right, JC? Yeah. Yes, we did. Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to mention that again. But speaking of the Houston Open, uh, several Gators did very well. <coughs> Alex Toast, Toasty tied for second with about five other dudes. Horschel came in third, and Tyson Alexander uh, still cast a check, came in 64. So he cast a check and made the cut. So congratulations to those guys. They go out to the uh, Bolero Open, which I – where is that, in San Antonio? That's in San Antonio. It's going to be a tournament for the guys that need to – keep their card. It's one of those fill-in tournament deals as far as I'm concerned. It's the only tournament going on on tour, but all the players are going to be in Augusta getting ready. Um, QB. So uh, I don't know how. I watched that last hole that Scotty Scheffler hard. He had a four and a half foot putt, and he just missed it to the left. But if he makes that putt, you know, the guy that won it, Jaeger, Jaeger, whatever, from Germany, he didn't birdie one hole on the back nine. He went par out. He parred out from 10 to 18 and was able to hold on and win the tournament because nobody could make a, a move. Nobody, they were stuck at 11 over, 11 under. And, uh, you know, there was something like six or seven guys at 11 under tied for second. And I, you know, I saw Scheffler stick it on 18 to four and a half feet. And you're thinking, okay, we're going to see sudden death. And he missed it. He missed it. So even the best in the world or the best in the world can miss those four and a half putts, folks. So there's still hope. You know, don't get upset when you miss those four and a half putt, foot putts. The best in the world can do it. No doubt about it. Dan says this. I was going to bring this up on Facebook Live brought to you by Mel. The women's tournament played with a wrong three point line. They oh. would lose their mind if that happened in the men's tournament. Yeah. So <laughs> it was out, uh, I think out in Spokane or somewhere. Uh, one of the one end was uh, the three point line was much farther back than the other one, uh, but the coaches agreed to go ahead and play it. I mean, I don't know what else you could have done. You have to go to a different arena or wheel in another court because you, you can't paint over it right there. But um, yeah, it was a mess. Yeah, so. to me, speaking of that women's game, uh, the women's league tournament, whatever, there is a huge game tonight. Um, it is Iowa. And it is LSU. This is, a, I think, a rematch from last year. And this Angel Reese player for LSU and the Caitlin Clark, you know, there's a somewhat of a rivalry there uh, because they all got into each other's uh, uh, kitchen last year with the you can't see me gesture and so forth like that. And it brought some drama to the game. And you've got this, uh, this really crazy coach for LSU, Mulkey, who's very successful, and Iowa – Tonight, Iowa is a one and a half point favorite against LSU. I would I would recommend, folks, if you're looking for something to watch, and I, I rarely, if ever, in fact, I actually never watch women's basketball, but this is something I think I'm going to watch tonight with Iowa and LSU. This Caitlin Clark, if you ever haven't seen her yet, if you haven't seen her yet, this is maybe your last chance uh, to see her in an Iowa uniform. She is as good as they say, and this will be a fun game tonight. I think you're – I think you're in for a real treat if uh, you want to see intensity, you want to see players that actually really, I mean, they're out there, they're leaving it on the court, they care. Watch Iowa and LSU tonight um, play in the uh, semifinals. I, I think you'll enjoy it. I think it's worth watching. Yep, I agree. She's uh, she's, yeah, she's unbelievable. Oh, she's got a good team as well. Yes, Rodney see. wants me to go ahead and he says the Gator Nation is hungry for good news. So do, do, do them a favor and make something up. All right, Rodney. Uh, Graham Mertz hit Aiden Mizell on three deep post routes in stride for touchdowns, and the defensive line sacked uh, our other quarterbacks six times. We couldn't block them. 
there. I made something up. What do you think about well, that, JC? I mean, I, that's great. Yeah. Hey, this guy, um, you're talking about Mizell. I, I mean, we talked a lot about him last year. Never heard from him. Hopefully, he's going to be the guy. He's going to be a real factor for Florida uh, this year. Last year, you know, uh, watching who we watched, you know, the, those kids played hard, but Mizell is somebody you've always mentioned, and I'm waiting for him to break out. Um, so hopefully, uh, you know, those, those deep routes you talk about, the number is eight, right? Eight. We're going to keep repeating that eight deep throws mm -hmm. per game minimum, right? QB. And that the number minimum. No. Yeah. You can do more. It's perfectly yeah. legal to do more. Oh, sure. Yeah. Minimal, minimum, minimum. Yeah. And, it, uh, a little Major League Baseball, J.C.'s Yankees are undefeated. Oh, uh, <clears throat> Wyatt Ooh. Langford uh, is batting three thirty three. Um, yeah. Had a pretty good start for the Rangers. They're at the Rays, uh, so I'm sure a lot of Gator fans will head down to St. Pete and watch him play. QB, knowing the Yankees-Houston uh, recent history and the record between those two, there was absolutely nobody on earth who saw them sweeping Houston in four games at Minute Maid Park. I mean, that's like that, – that, that, that's impossible. That's impossible. The Yankees – but apparently they got some help. You know this what? Kid, this guy Juan Soto, uh, he apparently he's, uh, he's a big deal. So, um, we'll he's see. Very four good. Games. He's very it's good. But, J.C., get, you know what? What? The Yankees and the Astros both have 158 more games to play. Yeah, that's right. I, I don't think anybody's worried. <laughs> no. I just can't – I couldn't believe what I saw. I mean, and even the Pittsburgh Pirates swept some by the Marlins, I think, this weekend. So, uh, you know, look, I know. It's baseball in April, my God, or March. Um, yeah, I, wake me up in September. Let me know how they're doing. But I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a fan. I love the Yankees. I'll watch it. I'll look at their score every night. But if they were on ESPN one night against the Cardinals or the Diamondbacks and I had something else to do, I'd probably do something else, to be honest with you. I would, too. Live a healthier lifestyle with our bowl, flavorful smoothies, and our amazing food. Tropical smoothie. When you eat better, you feel better. Speaking with JC on the Titan More High Line, courtesy of Comfort Tent, we'll have Mike Morgan uh, from the SEC Network, second portion of today's program. Good old Mike. Uh, yep. Text here. Uh, on the Titan MR text line from William. He says, JC, are you going to the final four? Well, you know, William, thank you for that question. I, I would love to go and on in a normal year I would, but I have a golf tournament to participate in. My annual big one up in Mississippi is this week. So um I'll be honed in up there in the middle of Neshoba County, Mississippi. Pull out your map if you don't know where that is, uh, because you'll need a map to find it. But it's in the middle of the state toward the eastern side with the state of Alabama. So I believe we'll see a lot of Alabama fans in that uh, in that building uh, watching the game with me in the sports bar or wherever on Saturday night. I don't know if it's the first game or the second game, but thank you for the question. I, I, I would love to go, but the answer is no. I'm going to be locked in at the Pearl River Resort, the Silver Star and the Dance and the Golden Moon at the Dancing Rabbit, one of my favorite places on earth. I can't wait to go. I've got $100 <laughs> in, in voucher credits, QB. I got $100 in match play, match play chips. I'm mm. going to have – yeah. So uh, that's going to be a fun place to go. I'll report back on the following Monday, a week from today. It's very exciting for me. All right. Uh, here's a text, uh, a few more minutes with JC before we get to Mike Morgan, a text from Robert. He says, guys, y'all's assessments of the baseball team so far, I know they've won every series, but they have not looked very dominant. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't care. Know how to answer I, that. I, I, well, here's how I'm going to answer it. If you win two out of three, you don't have to look dominant. You, If you win games coming from behind, I think that leads to confidence. With baseball, I think there's so much mental uh, – there's such a mental part of the game that if you believe you're going to win the game, whether it be in the ninth inning or in the second inning, you can win games in the second inning. Um, if you believe you can win the game from one through nine and you're going to come back and win and you've got guys like Caglione line driving home runs over the, over the wall into the berm, I believe you have done well. And I'm not as worried about the two losses to Florida State as it seems like the rest of the collective uh, Gator Nation is. But I do believe that when you're six and three in this league after three series, you can check mark it as being a success. I, I, that's as close to a, an evaluation as I can give you this early in the season because there's a lot of baseball to play. 
Okay, so I just pulled up the rankings. There are 10 SEC teams ranked in the top 25. Okay. <laughs> Arkansas, Arkansas is number one at 19 and three. Yeah. The Gators are 14 and nine. I don't know if this has been updated yet. This may be in, this is from uh, last week, but regardless. Yeah. This tells you what D1 baseball people think about the Gators. Okay. They're sitting, before this series, they're sitting sixth in America at 14 and nine. 14 I, and nine. Six in Nobody America. Nobody else in the top six in America. Nobody else in the top twenty-five has nine losses. So the teams that they have beaten, taken series from A and M, four in America. Um, LSU. LSU is number eight. So anyway, look. I don't know if they're as good as they were last year. Probably not. I mean, you lost some really good players, but as I try to tell people. Sully knows baseball, and he's trying to win every game. And he does. He may say he, I mean, he cares about the midweek games. We play FAMU, I think, tomorrow, the Rattlers. Uh, if we lose to the Rattlers, it's okay. We're <laughs> going to fly to Missouri. I promise we're going to fly to Missouri and go try to win that series. Well, yeah, you know, QB, a lot of times, too, keep this in mind, guys. April's a long month. If they win these series that they play in, they're going to have a good month of May. The idea is to host a regional and maybe be one of the top eight seeds. If they can do that, and right now, if it all started today, ranked number six, they would be one of the top eight seeds. So, guys, think about it. If you are in the top eight by the end of, the, by the end of it all in May, you're going to potentially host a super regional if you can win your own regional. You're definitely going to host a regional. So that's the whole goal yep. here. That's the whole goal. When Alabama's basketball team lost a game in December or January, they still survived the season, and now look what they're doing. I, same thing for NC State. NC State lost four games to end their season. They had to go through the tournament to get into the, the big dance, and they won five in a row. So it really comes down to how hot you get at the right time. And if you play progressively well – and you progressively win series, the chances are, in my estimation, the way I look at this, trying to look at it with some sort of logic, is that you're going to play well in the postseason. Now, that didn't happen for NC State. They're a fluke. That's kind of an outlier. But I think it happens when you go through a season and you want to get the, the momentum going for the postseason. And I, I'm, you know, I'm very confident that Florida will have a winning SEC record. They will win more series than they will lose. And they will host a regional. So, I mean, I think they will. That's which is what I believe is going to happen. That's what you have to have. Yep, no doubt about it. All right, JC, enjoy yeah. your day. We'll talk to you on Wednesday. We're going to get to Mike Morgan. He's going to fill us in on what's going on. All right, the Mike, world. big Mike. All right, my man. All right, that's JC. Join us on the Titan Animal Hotline, courtesy of Comfort Temp. Take a quick time out. We can come back. We will uh, be joined by the SEC Network's Mike Morgan. Talk a little hoops, baseball, whatever else you got there. For watching and listening to Pot Up with Matthews in the morning. We want to take this moment to thank our sponsors who keep the show going and pay the bills. Our premium sponsors are Crime Prevention Security Systems, large enough to serve you, small enough to care. Titan MRI, Gainesville's only locally owned and operated MRI facility. Melden Law, the only official injury and accident law attorneys of the Florida Gators. Peachland Dental, Gator Nation's first choice for dentistry in Port Charlotte. QC Kinetics, live pain-free with QC Kinetics. Campus USA, put some star power to work in your financial life with Campus USA Credit Union. Comfort Temp, comfort is our business, peace of mind is our promise. Dave & Buster's, eat, drink, play, watch. Radwear, your local provider of promotional products, uniforms, and apparel. Our gridiron sponsors are Auto ER, UF Bookstores, Silverback Concrete, Ruse Ogre State Farm Insurance, Radwear, F45, Quality Plumbing. Our touchdown sponsors are Adams Ribs, Gator Dominoes, Celebrate Primary Care, Gator Bait Media, Okito America, Style Cuts, Ironwood Golf Course, Big Mills Cheese Steak, McDonald's of Gainesville, 84 Lumber, Dowling Signs, Baker Sporting Goods, Silver Q Billiards and Sports Bar, if you're interested in promoting your business on the show, call Freddie at 352-284-3733. If you like what we're doing here, make sure to follow us and support the businesses that support us. Hi there, this is Coach Steve Spurrier, and I want to let you know that by popular demand, Spurrier's Gridiron Grill's delicious brunch is now served in a premium buffet. 
Ye have spoken, we have listened. And we're now serving Gainesville's only elevated buffet, complete with an omelet station, ginger sage chicken sausage, shredded short rib, and of course, our chicken and waffles. Plus, you can enjoy bottomless mimosas and Bloody Marys. So join us every Saturday and Sunday from 11 to 3 for the best brunch in town. Welcome back to the Crime Prevention Security System Studios. Large enough to serve you, small enough to care. Ruse Ogre State Farm offices a team of dedicated insurance professionals ready to help life go right with the right insurance options for you and your family. Visit ogreinsurance.com. Give them a call at 352-240-1779. Going to head back to the Titan Amore Hotline, courtesy of Comfort Temp. And this guy is brought to you by Campus USA Credit Union, our man Mike Morgan from the SEC Network. How you doing, Mike? Good morning, Shane. Good morning, Gator Nation. I'm doing well and hope everybody out there is as well. Yep, for sure. All right, let's start. Uh, just your thoughts. Uh, I mean, March Madness, there's really nothing like it in all the sports because you just never know what's going to happen. Uh, talk, what are your thoughts yesterday? Well, first, let's start with uh, the NC State game over Duke. Uh, I'm, I just do not like Duke, never have liked Duke. I'm so glad NC State found a way to come back in the second half. <laughs> well, you're not alone. Um, you know, I, the only reason I was pulling for Duke, uh, I had him in my bracket. So I would have had three out of the four right. Uh, I did not have Alabama, but um, uh, it would have been, it would have been nice to, uh, to have a little more success in the bracket. Uh, I, they just got outplayed. They never made any adjustments. John Shire is a young coach who I think got exposed a little bit. Uh, DJ Burns is obviously a unique player. You and I talked about this a week ago. He's like the meat hook, but taller, bigger, and quite frankly, a little more skilled. Uh, but he's not unstoppable. You know, and first off, defensively, he can't guard you or me because he can't move that quickly. So they didn't really exploit that on the offensive end. When he's on the floor, you go after him. I don't care who he's guarding. Because he's he he's not quick enough to move laterally. He's not quick enough to get outside. He's not quick enough to, to, to defend a smaller guard on the drive. They never really took advantage of that. And then defensively, it, it, even my wife is saying, like, it's the same move every time. He's going to go to the baseline and then shoot that little half hook shot. Don't they do something to stop it? And they, they never made an adjustment on that. I mean, they made the guy look like freaking Wilt Will Chamberlain in the 1960s. Uh, I, I just couldn't understand that. But th nevertheless, they're a, gr they're a great story and they're a unique story, Shane, because they're an 11 seed for a reason. They had to win the ACC tournament five games in five days, which is almost impossible, just to get in the field. And if they didn't, there was a lot of discussion that their coach was going to be fired. So the fact that they're in the Final Four, that's clearly the, the closest thing to a Cinderella dark horse uh, that we have. The, the only other thing I would say, I mean, UConn is UConn. Like, they're just ridiculous. Uh, but I, I'm happy for Nate Oates in Alabama. I've been covering Nate Oates a long time. I've known him since he was the coach at Buffalo. I used to call the MAC championship game up there in Cleveland. And I was like, this guy can coach. And the way their AD kind of stumbled upon him is really a unique story. It, you know, Greg Byrne was the AD at Arizona when Arizona played Buffalo and Buffalo beat Arizona. So that AD remembered that, filed it away in his memory bank and said, you know what, that guy can coach. So when the Alabama job came open, and you know how Alabama people are, we, we got to hire an Alabama guy, we got to hire a guy from the South, we got to, well, Nate Oates isn't any of those things. And people mm -hmm. didn't, need, didn't know who the hell Nate Oates was, and it turned out to be a great hire. So I, I think that's a phenomenal story from the SEC to, to get to that point. It was only a matter of time because he keeps flirting with it. Uh, this is the team that broke through, and I wish him well in Phoenix. I think the most fascinating thing about Nate Oates and his programs is, like, you know, you'll see it pop up on Twitter, the shot charts from their games. And it right. is unbelievable. Everything is within four to five feet. I mean, maybe less than that. It's layups and three-pointers. And if you take a mid-range right. shot, he takes you out of the game, but it is, it's fascinating. Yep. If you can, if any of our listeners have never seen that pull up their short shot, shot chart. And it's crazy. Um, you know, the other story is DJ Burns. You know, everybody's talking, uh, 
they, they act like he came from like Chipola Junior College. This guy was highly recruited, and he went to Tennessee initially. I don't right. remember him at Tennessee. Did he just not get playing time there, or did, was it not a good fit, and he ended up transferring? He, a great, great question. Uh, he was a top 100 rec- recruit. Not only did he not play at Tennessee, he redshirted. He was so out of shape, and quite frankly, he was a little bit of a problem. Uh, it, this, this is a feel-good story now. But he was not a feel-good athlete for a while. So he goes to Tennessee. Rick Barnes doesn't play games like that. It's like, you're, you're going to lose weight, and you're going to do things the right way, or you're never going to get off the bench. And true to his word, he redshirted. So then he goes to Winthrop, and he's a really good player at, at, at Winthrop. But, uh, you know, again, he's not the best thing since sliced bread. He winds up going to NC State. He screws his head on straight. You know, he's one of those guys who's like 23, 24 years old. He grows up. Believe it or not, he has lost weight. <laughs> doesn't necessarily show. He's clearly over 300 pounds. Uh, and he's got a great, smooth touch. And on the offensive end, he's a, he's a problem. He's a difficult matchup. But that's how that all went down. You're absolutely right. It's not like he wasn't uh, a good player. He's out of Rock Hill, South Carolina, which turns out a lot of great football players, by the way. Uh, and uh, eventually wound up at Tennessee, never saw the floor of a Rick Barnes. Yeah. Uh, Amy has a question on Facebook Live brought to you by Mellon Law. It says, Mike, who do you think has the best NBA career, Donovan Klingman, Zach Eady, or Dalton Connect? Dalton Connect. Uh, Eady, uh, look, Eady was phenomenal yesterday against Tennessee. But quite frankly, Tennessee just didn't have a guy. Like, the Adu – is supposed to be their rim protector. You saw how little he played against Edie. He's just not physical enough. He's not tough enough. And in the college game, uh, Edie is so big, so massive, that you get him the ball, and he was getting like three feet from the rim. That's, that's money in the bank. But I don't think in the NBA, and I could be wrong, and I hope I am wrong, Shane. I hope I am wrong. You know, the, the closest cop that he could hope to be, and he's not this good, but he could hope to be Yao Ming before Yao had all the injuries. Uh, I think he's going to be a second round pick and he's going to be a guy that, you know, will struggle to stay on rosters, uh, quite frankly, because, because again, the, the bigs in the NBA are so damn quick. They're not as big as Zach Eady, but who is Zach Eady going to guard? At, at Purdue, he just sits there in the paint. He just camps out in the paint. You can't do that in the NBA. All the fives can take you outside and shoot. Uh, Dalton Connect is NBA ready now. Uh, he is every bit of six six, maybe six seven, long, lanky, quick, uh, mid range shot good, three point shot good, and yes, he can drive and he's athletic. He will be a lottery pick, and he will be in the NBA for a long time. Uh, the kid from UConn, Klingon, I, I like his game a lot. I, I would put him second on that list because he is pretty athletic. He is pretty agile. Uh, so that would be my, that's a great question. That'd be my, my, uh, depth chart. It would be connect, clinging, and then eating. Uh, Tony says, is the three second rule dead in college basketball? Cause you know, there's been coaches complaining about Zach Eady just camping out in the, in the lane on offense <laughs> for, for multiple seconds. I, you know, I call over 35, 40 college basketball games a year. I could count on one hand. How many times I saw? How many times I saw a three-second violation? Yeah, I mean, the, he camps out there, and they're really good at, and he's really good. Give him credit. And by the way, the most impressive thing about him is that he played 39 minutes at that size. So I mean, he's clearly not out of shape. He's not very quick, but he does have endurance. But I mean, he's really good at like staying in there right around three seconds, and then all you got to do is, is get a foot outside the line. And then put and then camp your your rear end back in there for another three four seconds. They do that extremely well, uh, and and they haven't been called on it since I I don't think he's had one three second violation in this tournament. Uh, it's a good point, but he he knows exactly where the uh, where the gray area is. Let's put it that way. Yeah, he does. Uh, text on the Titanmark text line from Jay. Mike, he wants he wants your thoughts on Riley Kugel heading to Kansas. Man, I tell you what, um, I was a little surprised when I saw that. Uh, you know what, Shane, I was thinking about this. Sometimes guys just don't fit. Um, I don't think Riley Kugel is a bad kid. 
I don't think he was a. I mean, I watched shoot. Mark and I were there for an entire two hour practice in March, and you know he he works hard. He got along with his teammates, but it was clear that it, it was a, a a square peg in a round hole. It just did not fit, it, and it wasn't working. He lost his confidence. He didn't know what he was doing. Quite frankly, out on the floor, he didn't really have a feel for what his role was anymore. I think he started the season thinking, okay, I'm going to prove to NBA scouts what a great three-point shooter he is, and he's not a great shooter. What I think Kansas is banking on is that this kid has ridiculous natural athleticism. That is undeniable. His quickness, his uh, his overall just kind of almost like a, a, a sprinter in a basketball body, like that is that is NBA ready, and they're banking on you know what a new lease on life, a fresh environment. He'll work hard. Uh, he's not a bad kid, and we'll get him to reach his potential that he never reached at Florida. And we see this happen sometimes. It's just a change of venue that the light turns on, and he'll be ready to have a good season. So that's what Bill Self is banking on. He's done it before with other players, and it's worked out. And look, I wish him well. I I, I don't I won't miss him. At Florida, I don't think he offered much <laughs> for the team this year, but I, I wish him well and, and see if he can figure things out in Lawrence. Yeah, I agree. Speaking of like athleticism and stuff like that, you know, when you watch Houston play, and I think Kellen Sapps is a great coach. He's got tough, grown ass men that play for him. But will he ever go get just a dude who can knock down shots? <laughs> Not if that dude can't play really, really tenacious defense. That is that is a non-starter for Kelvin Sampson. Kelvin Sampson does not want a kid who's just a great shooter, but he's not a junkyard dog on defense. That's just the way Kelvin has always been, and coaches can be a little bit stubborn, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. He, he does keep winning, and he has had success at multiple spots. He's put a couple programs on probation, if we're being honest, but he, now you don't have to worry about that. You can buy players left and right, as we all know. So I, I, that's a great question, and it probably wouldn't hurt to just have some dude come off the bench and drill threes for you, but if that dude doesn't play defense the way he wants, then then, then Kelvin ain't going to be interested in him at all. All right, so before we move on from back college basketball, Mike, who, who you – I mean, obviously, we're probably going to see Purdue and UConn. Uh, do you think that's what the matchup is going to be? And where do you rank UConn? JC and I had this talk with some of our listeners early in the program. I mean, UConn is probably the most dominant program in the country right now. They are, uh, this snuck up on me, I'll be honest. They have won five national titles since 1999, five with three different coaches. And if they win six, With four different coaches since 1999, I mean, it's not your prototypical dynasty because the players turn over. It's college basketball, and that is a 25, 26-year span, whatever. But that still is phenomenal. Like, we think of the Blue Bloods, and we always think of the same programs, Duke, Carolina, Kansas, and we never put UConn in that. UConn has to be in that discussion. And the the last two – if – if they go ahead and steamroll two teams in the final four, the way they have steamrolled everybody the last two years, that's one of the best two year dynasties I've ever seen. It real and especially in an era where all these kids are entering the portal and, and leaving early for the NBA. I think it's a phenomenal accomplishment. And I, I sit there and I watch them, Shane, and I marvel at it because they're rarely the most athletic. They don't have the most amount of NBA guys. They, they, what they are is a team that is so connected beyond belief. You watch the, their stuff, and you uh, talk to the guys. Uh, you know those guys that do, uh, what's the Twitter handle? Florida Basketball Hour, Neil Blackman and, and Fawcett. Those guys are, are terrific at breaking down uh, X's and O's. Watch UConn in the half court and watch the movement and watch the cuts to the basket and watch they make defenses that they, they embarrass people, Shane. That what they are doing from an X's and O's standpoint, they are I'm not saying they don't have athletes. I'm not saying they don't have good talent. They do. But they also freaking embarrass people with the way they dissect you 
on the offensive end. And again, that, that goes back to coaching. Yeah. Uh, we just got a text on the Titan Mark text line from Eric. He says, Mike, who would you take the Gators back to back teams that won the national title or these last two UConn teams? <laughs> oh, I'm a little biased there, but, uh, well, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. I'll take the talent of those Gators teams over these two UConn teams. And I'm, I'm not knocking the talent. I mean, I, they, they've got talented players, but I'll take Noah, Horford, Brewer, uh, Tari and Green, and my man who's now doing radio uh, on, on the Gator Lee Network, one of, yeah, one of the okay. best three-point shooters in postseason history. I'll take those five talent-wise, and this just in, Billy Donovan's a Hall of Fame coach, so I'm, I'm still going to give the edge to the Gators. Uh, maybe I'm a little biased there, but those teams were so damn good. And, and again, that second year, nobody was stopping them. And that's the way UConn looks right now. I hope somebody gives them a fight. I hope these aren't two blowouts and, and we don't have a good Final Four because I think overall it's been another entertaining tournament. Uh, but I'd like to see UConn at least tested. Brad wears a family-owned business that prides itself in excellent customer service while providing quality and affordable promotional products and customized apparel. A few more minutes with Mike Morgan on the Titan Amore Hotline, courtesy of Comfort Temp. Uh, question here from George. He says, do you think they're going to expand the tournament? Another great question. Your audience is all over it today. Um, unfortunately, yes. I, I don't think we're done. I think at bare minimum, it's going to be 72. And at maximum, it's going to be 80. So they can keep adding those little four-team pods, those which would basically be play-ins. That's kind of what they are. Uh, so I would not be surprised if very, very soon we see it go from 68 to 72. And much like the college football playoff in the blink of an eye went from 12 to 14, we could, in a blink of an eye, go from 72 to 80. All right, let's move on to college baseball. Uh, the Gators uh, are playing really well in um, SEC play. They have uh, FAMU tomorrow night, then they go out to Missouri. Missouri's very – they're struggling mightily in baseball. Um, I don't know how much you've watched. You've been on vacation. I think you're still on vacation. How much you've watched of the Gators or just SEC baseball so far, but just your thoughts on the league early on. Well, I, I what – Let's start with Florida, and then I'll, I'll work into the uh, the macro. Um, just like we've talked about on your show before, don't get all bent out of shape about the midweek losses. Uh, the people at D1 Baseball, which it, it really has become the pole of record, and maybe I'm uh, – I don't think it's even biased. I mean, I know all those guys. Uh, I've worked with all of them that, that run that site, but they're, but they're the most plugged in. Nobody cares about the coaches' poll or the – baseball america poll it's the d1 poll and the d1 poll as you rightly pointed out has them ranked very highly the other thing if you go to that website and i'm not trying to steer traffic here they don't pay me as a spokesman but if you go to d1baseball.com you can check out the rpi it's the one site that i know of that you can get the rpi and the rpi you could make the argument is used even more than the net is in basketball when it comes to tournament time and the RPI is going to be very friendly to the Gators, just like the polls are, because they understand strength of schedule. They understand that the Gators are challenging themselves as much as anybody in the non-con every year, because you play the likes of Florida State, Miami, and all those mid-major Florida schools are very dangerous, particularly if you're throwing your number five, six starter on a Tuesday night, which is what you're going to do. You're going to save your main guys for conference play, and they're throwing one of their aces because sometimes they do that. So uh, I, I, the, the Florida is still a loaded team. Sully is still one of the best recruiters in the, in the country. And Caglione's one of the best players of this generation. I mean, he is ridiculous. I saw the walk-off. Um, no, it's another stacked Florida team. I think Arkansas might be the team to beat this year overall in the SEC. I think Dave Van Horn for 20-something years has been one of the best coaches, one of the best minds in college baseball. And he's got a hell of a pitching staff. I, I love pitching depth. I don't get overly impressed just because you got a great Friday night guy or even a great Friday Saturday. Uh, postseason college baseball, if you don't have a deep bullpen, you're not going far. And they have got a loaded, loaded bullpen. So 
I think Florida's doing what you need to do. Just keep winning SEC, keep winning SEC series. Two out of three here, yeah. two out of three there. And if you do that, you will reap the rewards of a very good uh, selection Sunday. You'll, you'll get to host uh, regional and hopefully a, a top eight super seed as well. But make no mistake about it, they're one of the best teams in a stacked Southeastern Conference this year. Yeah, for sure. Baseball, Major League Baseball got cranked up. Wyatt Langford uh, was hitting 333. Uh, you know, oh. I, I don't know. I don't follow Major League Baseball. I'm only following it because of Wyatt, the local kid, the yeah. Gator. Uh, but his, you know, it's so hard to make it to the Major League. And I feel like he made it extremely fast. Am I crazy to think that? No, you are not crazy at all. In fact, it, it is a very, very short list of guys that get drafted in June and don't start their career in the minor leaguers, in the minor leagues. The first one I thought of off the top of my head was Bob Horner, the great Atlanta Brave. Uh, Bob Horner went straight from Arizona State into the show, never played minor league baseball. The, Shane, that is a point zero 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 one percent of guys particularly hitters every now and then you'll have a, a a nasty pitcher that just throws filthy stuff and they can't figure especially a reliever and he doesn't even need to be seasoned in the minors because they know they can use that arm right off the bat could be like a left-handed specialist out of the bullpen who just got done at tcu in the world series i think kyle finnegan fits that uh, mold uh and then he winds up on a, on a roster on opening day what, what Wyatt Langford is doing is almost unheard of. Uh, even the best of the best college hitters, even the, the top 10 draft picks, they all have some time in the minor leagues before they get called up. And it's hard to even get called up in your first year as a rookie. To start on opening day, uh, that is phenomenal. That, that is just a tribute to Wyatt Langford. I remember the first game I had with his, I think he was a sophomore, and I just remember solely just raving about that kid in every way. I, I, he, he's obviously had a chance to rave about a lot of players, but there was something different when he was talking about Wyatt Langford. It's like, man, this guy must be really good. Yeah, this just in, he's, he's that good. Yeah, uh, Dan says he's had only 44 minor league games played now in the big league. So, yeah, uh, looks like he's going to be their DH for most of the year. I don't know if he'll ever play out in the – I guess he's still playing in the outfield. I'm not sure where they have him penciled in. But, Mike, good stuff as always. Enjoy your vacation, and we'll talk to you next week, my man. You got it. Thanks a lot, Shane. Appreciate it. That's Mike Morgan joining us on the Tight Number Hotline. Curtis said Comfort Temp. He's brought to you by Campus USA Credit Union. Hope everybody enjoyed uh, today's program. I'll try to get some information. You guys probably know more about the scrimmage than I do being out of town. I'm sure the message boards uh, filled you all in if they have some secret folks in there watching the scrimmage. So anyway, have a great day and uh, we'll see y'all folks tomorrow. Take care.